Islands Hospice serves local patients and their loved ones through hospice, supportive, and transitional care programs. During the pandemic, many families experienced grief in some way. Many lost loved ones, some unexpectedly. COVID-19 restrictions limited in-person gatherings, preventing families from holding funerals and celebrations of life to honor those they lost. Every year, Islands Hospice invites families and the community to a remembrance ceremony honoring those we have loved and cared for. Because of gathering restrictions, they were unable to hold their in-person remembrance ceremony this year, so they partnered with KHON for a special broadcast, Healing Through Remembrance. We'll hear from Islands Hospice staff and family who will offer unique perspectives on the complexities of grief, including anticipatory grief and coping strategies to help heal hearts. Keoki Rebello is from the Valley Isle, and he gives us an overview of services both on Oahu and Maui. The yeah, Islands Hospice started in Honolulu in 2008 and on Maui in 2014. And, you know, Islands Hospice is actually one program in a, multi a multitude of programs that we offer. There's palliative care, there's supportive care. Um, I think that Islands Hospice does really well in overextending resources and supports to the patients that we care for. I think that the team as a whole, um, the interdisciplinary team which involves the physician, the nurses, the spiritual care people, the social workers, I think that all of them together are able to build really solid foundations of support for every patient. And I think that's something, one of the many things that Islands Hospice does well. Um, also, we have the inpatient homes on both Maui and Oahu, which is a great benefit to the community for people who cannot be cared for at home, for people who don't have another place to go. In hospice care, I think that a lot of people pay a lot of attention to the end of life itself, whereas I think that the journey to end of life is far more important. Um, at Islands Hospice, we focus on the quality of the life remaining for the people that we care for, as well as their family and friends. It's about living at the end of it all, and I think that Islands Hospice does really well to focus on that quality over the time remaining. So Healing Through Remembrance came around because of COVID, of course. You know, COVID has closed off a lot of options and opportunities to get together and gather as we usually do at Islands Hospice to celebrate the lives of the people that we've taken care of, to continue to provide support to the families of the people that we've taken care of. So Healing Through Remembrance was our way of continuing to reach out, continuing to provide that support, continuing to be present in the lives of families and friends of the people that have received services from us. Um, I, as well as Islands Hospice, thinks it's very important that that continue even throughout this pandemic, even throughout the restrictions that we have. So this was a means to continue that and continue being there and being present and just providing compassion and efficient support because this is an ongoing process. It doesn't end, you know, when your loved one or your family member or whoever it is that was receiving care from Islands Hospice is no longer with us. The support doesn't end. The communication doesn't end. Our presence in your life doesn't end because your grief doesn't end when that life ends. I got a chance to sit down with Christy Vaskovich, a registered nurse with Islands Hospice. We spoke about grieving and what it means to both the patient and families. I'm joined now by Christy Vaskovich. She's a registered nurse with Islands Hospice. And I would love for you to tell everyone what it's like helping families through the grieving process. Sure, so the journey through grief is very different for every patient and every family. 
So when I meet with patients and families, I really start the process of just listening to them, let them talk, let them voice their concerns and worries. Um, for example, I just took care of a patient and their loved one, and um, it was a, a husband and a wife. And mm -hmm. the wife was really struggling, and his goals were comfort. But for her, she didn't want to let go, so she wanted all aggressive treatment. But when I pulled her aside, because I felt like she needed one-on-one -on -one attention, she really voiced to me that her goals were for him to be comfortable and that he wasn't suffering. But yet, she was struggling as far as her grief and her anticipatory grief and knowing that her role was gonna change. So she went from a loved one, a wife, to now a caregiver, mm. somebody who's taking care of him on a daily basis. She also voiced her concern about financials. So he was the sole provider of their household. So now she's worried about what's gonna happen after. And what does that look like after he passes? And so what I really needed to do for her was just answer those questions and listen to her and just let her talk. So once I was able to address some of these concerns, we were able to regroup and go have a conversation with both of them together because really their goals were comfort. What is anticipatory grief? Sure, that's a great question. So grief is usually after a loss. So after we lose, whether it's someone or something, where anticipatory grief is when we acknowledge that down the road, we are gonna have a loss. Anticipatory grief can sometimes present as anger, frustration. In her case, she had some guilt about what she could have done differently. The biggest thing that we can offer them is someone to talk to, to get them counseling, emotional support. Um, a social worker could even meet with them and just talk through these things because they're gonna be able to take better care of their loved one if they are taking care of themselves as well. And everybody grieves differently too, um, even children. There's different stages in grief and how they manage grief themselves. So we really wanna make sure that we're addressing everybody very individually and giving them the time that they need. Do you have any tips for families that are experiencing a difficult diagnosis? Yeah, my best advice is really just to talk to somebody, reach out to Islands Hospice, we're really here to provide support, to provide resources, and get you as much support as possible. Lurleen Liu heads volunteer services at Islands Hospice. She leads a team of compassionate volunteers who selflessly share their time and talents with patients and their ohana. Aloha, my name is Lurleen Liu. I'm a volunteer field coordinator, and um, I am recruit volunteers to come onto Islands Hospice. So we recruit um, volunteers that goes out and do some events with us, visit patients. Um, they deliver flower, flowers from our florists that donate flowers. We do many things that, um, for the patients. And occasions, on occasions, like Valentine's and Mother's Day, Father's Day, we do craft and we have the volunteers go out and deliver to the patients as well. In front of me here are roses made out of coconut leaves. And this is done by one of our volunteers, Alan. I recruit volunteers from schools, um, colleges, high schools. They're, um, they're ages from uh, 13 to whenever. And um, we do the uh, elderly mostly. They, they love to come in and help and be with a patient um, because they too have lost someone and they feel that they be there to help and be a part of and support the patient um, while they're grieving or just to be there and listen. It gives them joy, it gives them peace and happiness. Director of Support Services Sally Hanley will share with us her experiences with Islands Hospice and talk about some coping techniques. Three years ago, I came to work at Islands Hospice as a chaplain and currently, I'm the Director of Support Services. I oversee our spiritual care department, our volunteer coordinators, and our bereavement services. In bereavement services, we follow grieving families for 13 months, offering encouraging phone calls, letters, written educational material, individual counseling, 
and group support groups. By definition, grief is the process of dealing with a loss. In 2007, this became a reality to me when our youngest son was a victim of a pedestrian hit and run accident. Three months later, my father died. A year later, my husband died of a sudden heart attack. And three months after that, my mother died on hospice. So the grief process, to me, is very important. It's a small word that tries to explain a plethora of emotions. It's not five easy steps. It doesn't happen in a straight line. It is a process that many times feels like a roller coaster ride. But there are techniques, there are support and things that you can do that can help you through the process. There is a pathway to healing. Writing in a journal can be very helpful. Some people find a gratitude journal very helpful. I know that right now to you that may sound very hard. I do remember one day when my gratitude journal only said, no one in my family died today. Getting out and getting exercise is important. Sitting in the sun for five minutes, going to the beach, anything that gets you out of sitting on the couch or lying in bed is very helpful. An effective tool is a memory box. I've used this a lot with children. It's a good exercise for families together or individually. I brought today my mother's memory box since we just celebrated Mother's Day. I have some pictures of my family. Of course, they're digital prints these days. And my favorite picture of her right before she died. She was quite a character, <laughs> had a great personality. There's two things my mom was known for, whether it was first thing in the morning as she was serving breakfast or last thing at night before she went to bed, she always had her lipstick on and she always had her earrings on. And if you speak to any of the family, those are two things you never saw her without. She also loved the ocean. She lived in Florida a lot, visited Hawaii. And I have a few seashells that were her collection, a sand dollar we collected together at one time. We went on a trip to Australia, and I have a little bell that was a memento there. I have a rock that one of my grandchildren painted when she died for her to rest. And I have the little shells she's got when we went to church here in Oahu that she just was one of her prized possessions. So as you can see, the idea is you put things in at the time of death or whenever during your grieving process that you feel ready to, that remind you of the person. It might be mementos you have from them, or it may just be something that brings a memory of them. Shana Tuichi's father was an Islands Hospice patient. She shares how the good people there helped her through the grieving process. So my dad was um, suffering a long time, first with diabetes, and then he didn't take care of it, so he went into kidney failure. So he was on dialysis for about five or six years, and I was on the mainland at this time. So when my mom needed help, I um, came back home, and you know he, we took him to dialysis, and then we knew that towards the end, because he was declining um, at a rather painfully slow rate, but he was declining, we knew that we needed some help and support uh, at the end. Um, so my mom, I think she, mu she must have talked to about three agencies and she decided on islands because she just felt the connection there and just the, um, the, the service and what they offered. And then when she met Chaplain Sally, she just felt a really strong connection to Chaplain Sally and that's how she made the decision to, um, to use ho uh, islands hospice. And then I met um, Chaplain Sally after my dad passed and went for grief counseling. After my dad passed, I, I was diagnosed actually with PTSD and depression. And grief counseling um, helped me in a way that it, it well, Chaplain Sally helped me where, um, you know, she didn't judge me. She didn't tell me how long my grief was going to last which a lot of people, you know, kind of sort of condemn me, I think, for being sad after so many months had passed. 
but grief counseling was essential for me because I had to be able to um, face the grief rather than stuff it. And just Sally just gave me a, a safe place to to share and to just kind of fall apart. Because um, if I didn't do that, I would not have been able to move forward. So um, grief counseling was essential in, in my own healing. It was about um, six months after my dad passed and I was just grief stricken. I mean, my mom and I, I moved back home and we would just like stare at the walls and I couldn't function. Um, and one morning I remember just thinking, you know, I, I kind of want to paint something today and I don't know where that came from. So I went to Walmart, I bought a piece of canvas and some paint and I just, this is the first painting I painted. Um, and from that point on, I painted like 24 seven for like several months. Art was very therapeutic for me. I don't know why, I don't know how it came about, um, but it gave me time with my dad actually. Like I, while I'm painting, I would talk to him and cry and laugh and I would kind of like tell him everything I didn't tell him when he was here physically. So yeah, it did um, spark something to, in my healing and I'm, I'm really grateful for it. But I celebrate my dad every day. Every time I do an art piece, um, I talk to him every day. I say good morning, good night. I mean, I think he lives on through the fact that I can actually still have a relationship with him. And this wouldn't have been possible, I think, um, if, I haven't, if I hadn't gone through the grief process completely, I wouldn't be able to endure the, the pain and the sadness. I think it gave me the, um, the liberty to, to talk about him and, and still, because I remember in the beginning, I couldn't even talk about him without crying, you know? And I just, I wanted to stuff it. But um, Sally just very gently was very supportive in me kind of cleaning out the, the grief. I think grief is a very individual and personal um, role that we all travel in different ways. But one thing I, I do know for sure is that I hope people don't let other people tell them you should stop grieving or it's time to stop grieving and move on. Because even for me, um, I've come a long way, but the grieving is still going on. I mean, I don't think it's ever going to end because you really love that person and your love doesn't stop. So why does the grief stop, you know? It's just, um, I'm handling it better now, you know, and I'm able to move on, which I know my dad would want me to. So that's one way I honor him by having the strength to process this and and live the rest of my life so that he's proud. Up next is Yoshina Sui, a nurse practitioner with Islands Hospice. We'll talk about her journey to becoming a nurse and what it's like in hospice. Joined now by Yoshina Sui, a nurse practitioner. I wanna know, how did you choose nursing? How did you get into nursing and why hospice? Well, nursing goes back all the way to Nepal. That's where I was born, born and raised in Nepal. And um, my mom rescues women from sex slavery, trafficking. We have people with HIV AIDS, so all different diseases. And I grew up taking care of them since very early on. So I knew providing one-on-one -on -one care, what taking care of death and dying just came naturally. And I knew that's where I wanted to be. And nursing just fell in that role perfectly because we get to do that in bedside. That's how I chose nursing. And years later, I ended up going to University of Hawaii and graduating from there. Can you tell me about your work with families? Work with families, well, with Islands Hospice, I've done several things, um, like RN case manager, nursing site, hospice site, uh, transitional care nursing, supportive care nursing. So all of those things. Now, as a nurse practitioner role, it's all different. Our main goal is to provide comfort, be there, be present for the families. And as a practitioner, we order medications for pain management, symptom management, and also um, advanced healthcare directive, talking about end of life goals. Goals of care discussions are very important. A lot of people think of the loss of family members. How do nurses and staff at Islands Hospice deal with the loss of patients? We cry. We talk about patients, we cry, we grieve, just like anybody else, right? 
Can you tell us a story that may be memorable to you of something that you've dealt with, families that you've visited and have helped? I remember when I first started with Island Hospice about almost eight years ago. Um, like I said, being born and raised in Nepal, I don't really have any families in here. So hospice job is really so rewarding that when I go visit patient, I knew at the beginning I was kind of worried. Oh my gosh, you know, I have accent. I'm from different place. How is people gonna um, see me? But as soon as I started this job, I started going to patients visit. We have so much love in Hawaii, so much aloha. People are so accepting when we do home visits. I just remember today, like like yesterday, I, I would call him Papa K, <laughs> one of my patients. He's from the other side of the island. Um, yeah, so he was very welcoming and the whole family and they made me feel like a family. And of course our job is not just to provide medical, right? But also be there, be present, like I mentioned earlier. So I remember he had some end stage heart failure. So he loved visiting nurses so much that every time we would try to leave, it's like, oh, I have chest pain, you know? So. <laughs> I'm sure he could be having chest pain, but at the same time, we, we also knew that he wanted us to stay and talk. You know, that's how much he loved. And that's how much I love my job, too. And I would tell him, okay, after a couple hours, I would tell him, okay, Papa, take some morphine and nitro. You're going to be fine. I'll see you tomorrow. And of course, when he passed, it was hard. He passed later in the evening, and I couldn't go because of family thing, and it was late the other side. but. The families invited us to funeral, and I still see the rest of the other families. So I have a lot of warm memories like that with hospice, and it's, I'm so glad that, you know, this is not just a job. This is where my mission, my faith, and everything blends in together, and I'm thankful for Papa K. Roy Hamada volunteers his time and talents with Islands Hospice. He has dedicated hundreds of hours over the years singing to the Islands Hospice patients and their ohana. My name is Roy Hamada. I've been with Island Hospice for about three years now uh, as a volunteer. Um, a friend of mine who is the volunteer coordinator, um, I, I met her through one of my friends um, when we were playing music. Um, and she asked if I would want to be a volunteer. I really didn't know what hospice was about and what, what kind of job a volunteer would be doing and stuff. But at first it was, um, you know, spending time in the office uh, folding envelopes and doing stuff like that in the office. And um, one of the opportunities for music came up where um, I ended up playing uh, for like one or two patients, you know, I, w I would get to go to their house and perform. So. The music part is, you know, um, one of the one of the things that I think makes it kind of special for people that are going through hospice. Music is just one part of it. The the care that the Islands Hospice nurses, the staff, and stuff that that they do is really important, and it's so good to have you know, somebody helping to take care of your loved ones at the end, you know, because it is about life and how we help people get through it. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. From glen to glen and down the mountainside The summer's gone and all the roses are falling It's you, it's you must go and I must bide But come ye back when summer's in the meadow or oh, when the valley's hushed and white with snow I'll be here in sunshine or oh, in shadow oh Danny boy oh Danny boy I love you so 
But when you come and all the flowers are dying, if I am dead and dead as I will be, I pray you find the place where I am lying and kneel and say and say it love for me and I shall hear the soft you thread above me and all my grave will warmer sweeter be for you you love me and I will sleep in peace until you come to me and I will sleep in peace until you come to me For anyone who's experienced loss of any type this year, we hope that you found comfort knowing that you are not alone. The compassionate healthcare professionals of Islands Hospice are here to support you throughout your family's journey.